Oh, good afternoon. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me on this webinar. Um, yeah. it's, it's been so, yeah, it's been such a pleasure. I've, I've worked with you all in the past, but I really wanted to get this group of people together because I've had individual conversations with each of you and gone, gosh, that is so interesting. Um, and I just have this like philosophy around the whole open source mentality of just sharing with no real agenda, you know, just, just sharing experiences, sharing thoughts, interesting things to talk about. Um, and I wanted to share this with a broader audience. So I'm super grateful that you've all taken some time. Um, and hello to everyone who has um, logged into this session. We've got an hour uh, set aside for this. So I hope you're comfortable. Grab a notebook, a cup of tea or coffee. Um, and yeah, just listen away. I'm more than happy for this to be interactive um, everybody has the ability to use the chat function so we'll just apply that when appropriate um, I'll pick and choose some questions um, as and when but let's get started on today's webinar so um, this is quite a broad topic we're going to be talking around uh, challenges choices championing success big turning points big learning moments throughout our our personal and professional lives and um, so I'm going to start with an open question um, and I want to ask around um, what challenges you have experienced and how that has impacted certain choices that you have made. Now then, big question there. Before we do that, let's do an intro and then maybe in your intro, let me know if you'd like to go first. <laughs> I can. Do you want me to start? Excellent. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Marecki. Um, I live in Yorkshire as you can tell by the accent. Um, I am a mum to two very young girls. So the teenage years are going to be brutal, I know. Um, I'm a senior consultant at a company called CGI. I work in the insurance sector and I split my time between Leeds and London. Um, my speciality is delivery. So all things project, program management. Um, and for those that are familiar with product delivery and software delivery, I like Scrum. When I'm not mum or work, Liz, I am the bringer of snacks, taxi driver, cleaner, cook, I, <laughs> nose blower. Uh, but in my spare time, I do like to go to the gym and ride my mountain bike and also cuddle my therapy dog. I am a huge advocate for women in the workplace. So I'm so pleased that Tony reached out and asked me to do this. And I'm really excited to share some experience and learnings today. And I will start by answering that question if you'd like me to Tony before we go into the others yeah Absolutely. is some of the choices and challenges that we've had is about that work-life balance that everybody talks about everyone talks about that balance between career and mum and parenthood and everything else I got that balance severely wrong after the birth of my first child I went back into my career thinking that I had to be better than everybody else that I had something to prove that I was up there and an equal with my male counterparts because I've always worked in male dominated um, industries and I had to be seen as dependable Liz first one in last one out the person that had to be there in a crisis never stand me down in a crisis but I took this to the extreme and in around 2014 I wanted to keep proving and moving ahead in my career and that went above and beyond looking after my daughter I never did pick up I always stayed late I had a great support network at home and then one day I decided to finish early and I drove to the nursery to pick up my little girl and that was very unusual for me but I knocked on the door I saw what I thought was new nursery staff but they really weren't they'd been there for quite some time and they all looked at each other really confused like who was this woman at the door what was she doing never seen her before and they actually wouldn't let me in so if anybody's had children or they've got a nursery they know that there's that safeguarding they didn't have a clue who I was um thankfully as they went off to talk to and seek guidance my little girl ran over shouting mummy at the top of her voice obviously thrilled to see me because it was unusual and the nursery staff at that point opened the door asked who I was checking that I was mummy and actually what happened next was really upsetting their exact words were I'm really sorry um it's usually dad that comes and we didn't know who you were and at that point that was a turning point that just made me think wow how have I got to this point how have I got to this point where I cannot even enter a nursery as the primary caregiver as mums are normally and they didn't know who I was so 
I decided at that point that I would find that balance, that I would say no, that I would leave work on time, that I would at least pick up three times a week. And if anyone from CGI or my company is listening, don't hold me to this, but is there really a deadline or a task that is more important than your family or that small person that's wanting to see you and thinks the world of you or that elderly relative that you care for and, you know, you might see for the last time or anybody that you may care for that, that cares about you? You need to ask yourself that. And I think in some cases, and, and I wouldn't be a delivery professional if I didn't say that, it's okay that if sometimes that deadline or that task or that release or that big moment in your career is worth it and is a little, you have to put it first. But if that becomes more often than not, you need to pause and reassess what goes on. And I'm not, I'm still not brilliant at it. I'm still learning, but I am better. And that was one of the biggest choices that I made in my career. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, and, and no doubt a very, very challenging turning point. But um, you must be delighted to have actually received that because there'll be lots of people maybe still a little bit blind yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sevda, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Tony. And thanks, Liz, for that really honest um, account of um, your turning point. So to everyone um, on the webinar today, I'm Sevda. Uh, well, you see, I'm Sevda Gerpenar, but I'm actually Sevda Newman. Um, just haven't changed that on Zoom. Um, I work at LinkedIn. I've been at LinkedIn for eight and a half years. I am currently managing a sales team um, across the advertising and marketing part of our business. But I have um, worked across many different business lines within LinkedIn. Um, within the technology sector and previous to that um, in market, marketing and advertising. Um, I too am a mummy of two, um, a little boy, and I've just such a little boy who's one and a girl who's four. And I've actually just returned to work um, from my maternity leave. And, you know, I'm, Liz, I'm feeling that um, juggle of the two hats that you're talking about now. Um, and thinking about what your boundaries, um, actually something I'd say to that is, um, you know, I, I definitely feel the mum guilt and the work guilt. So am I there enough for my children? Am I there enough for work? Um, am I there enough for my team at work who are like your next lot of children? Um, so that is a real hard juggle. And it's if anyone on this call has got it completely right, um, please pipe up and let us know. Um, but I say something um, that had been a turning point, um, and I too am a huge advocate um, for women, um, gender equality, um, and women in the workplace, and really thinking about um, the opportunities that we have. Um, and one of the things that was a recent challenge was that when I was pregnant with my son, that I've, like I say, just turned one, um, I, a new job came up at LinkedIn and uh, the challenge for me was um, all internal, internal thoughts of should I apply for this role? Is it fair that I apply for a role when I'm pregnant? Um, it was very early on in my pregnancy when the role came up um, and I really struggled with is this the right thing to do? Will my reputation be tarnished at work? Um, it was a time when we weren't yet back in the office um, fully, so many people didn't know that I was pregnant. Um, and I almost didn't apply for that job because I was pregnant. And so the challenge really was me um, getting in the way of myself. And then in the end, uh, I did apply for it. I am actually doing that job now, uh, but I'm glad to say. And the thing that got me over that challenge was um, the thought of if it was someone else in our company, what advice would I give them? What would I tell them to do? And the other part was if I want to be a strong female role model in our, my company and beyond, what what is my responsibility and my responsibility is to do things like apply for a job when I'm pregnant so that I can lead by example um and so I'm very pleased that I did come over that internal challenge myself um because you know actually I got the role um we worked through what happened to the team when I was on maternity leave and now I've come back and you know ready to um 
fully embrace that role. Um, but there definitely is um, thinking about that, you know, that challenge of the two hats of parenthood and um, and your work career. I really got in the way of myself um, when I was going through that process of what is right for my personal life and my work life. Yeah, and what's kind of a bit crazy, Sevda, is around, obviously you've said that it was quite early on in your pregnancy and, you know, God bless that you've had a successful pregnancy, but the world doesn't always work that way. And actually that mindset that you had, which was about making that decision that was right for you in the moment of, the, of time, because we can't see what goes on in the future. And actually that decision-making process could have gone down many different avenues, dependent on how life turns out to be. So I think yeah. there's some really interesting advice in there that you've given so far. Thank you. Laura, hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to be here. Um, yes. That was, I, I love that. I love listening to you both. That was so interesting. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm Laura. Um, I'm a life coach. I'm also an organisational consultant. So I help sort of value-based charities to develop the organisational strategy and have greater impact or income generate. Um, and at the moment, I'm doing an interim role as chief of staff for the Scout Association. Um, I am also a mother of two. I've got a nine year old and six year old, which makes me feel a bit old, but it's wonderful. <laughs> two girls as well, uh, same as Liz. And um, I guess I could talk about that in terms of challenge. And I, but I think Liz spoke so beautifully to that point. So I'm going to address something slightly different, which is for me in terms of turning points and challenges. Actually, there was a really defining moment for me a few years ago um, when I decided to quit um, my job, which was a good job. I was in a senior leadership position in a, a sort of a large, reputable organisation in the UK um, against the advice of almost everybody. And I retrained to teach. And I did that not because I wanted a career in teaching and nobody seemed to sort of really entirely get that. I just wanted to experience it for a year or two. I did that for a year. I had a brilliant time. But it went against a lot of um, conventional wisdom and advice. A lot of people sort of said, why are you leaving this really successful job that you've got? You know, the next step is, is direct your CEO. Like, this is the worst time to step off the ladder. If you step off now, you might never get back on. And consequently, you know, you, you, you might really regret this. And on a practical level, it didn't really seem to make any sense. I had two young kids. And when you took away my childcare bill, because they're preschoolers, I was earning about 50 quid a month to work about 70 hours a week. So this all seemed completely insane, but there was something inside me which just said, I just want to experience something different. I've climbed the ladder, I've reached a fairly high um, position on that and I'm ready for a change and I want to learn and do something different. And I think for me, that was a real moment when I basically reassess what success looked like. And I think for a large part, all of my twenties and some of my thirties, I was chasing, chasing a version of success, which, was kind of predetermined like you go to school you go to uni you get the best qualification you go to the biggest and best organization you go up as high as you can and I did did that and on the face of it was really successful and I was really happy there and it was a great employer and I had brilliant times and I don't regret a minute of it I loved it and I learned so much but there was this other side of me which was sort of itching to explore and to learn and have different experiences and, and so I went and did that and as a consequence of me doing that year as a teacher I then a door opened and I had an opportunity to take on for, uh, on consultancy and they needed experience of senior leadership and strategy and organization but also the education sector which I now had and as and I did that role um, as a consultant and alongside that I picked up other work and I'd uh, previously when my first child was born I trained as a coach and um, and I, I then found myself you know doing freelance coaching work again and and absolutely loving it and so in a way the turning point for me was very much about discovering what my own version of success was and that was turning away from conventional wisdom turning away from the traditional path and and that journey very much continues for me now and I think in recent years since I've been self-employed or I'm now a business owner but um you know I've had to think about picking and choosing my my work and and a lot of, again, I read books about marketing and positioning and do one thing really well and be known for it and get your brand on point. And I know all of the theory, but in reality, what I found over a few years of doing this is 
I really like being what I think a lot of people call a slashy or a multi-hyphenate. I really love coaching. I really love consultancy. And I really love having the ability to do my own creative projects on the side. And that goes against a lot of quite traditional advice about what's right. But I feel so much joy and sort of like deep fulfillment in that. And I feel like I'm ticking a lot of my values and my interests. And I guess that's that's kind of one of my, the, the point I'd really like to make in this webinar, which is like getting to know yourself and what makes you tick. And sometimes there's so much pressure on women to be like a successful career woman with maybe with kids or with a relationship and all these other things, all these boxes you have to tick, all these versions of what perfect looks like. And you know, it's bloody exhausting. Mm -hmm. And I think just taking some time out to reflect on actually what brings you happiness and fulfillment is so unique to each and every one of us. And there is no right or wrong. And I think so much of the time we're just chasing what we think we should be doing rather than actually what we really want out of life. So I think that for me was a real turning moment to trust my own opinion and my own gut instinct more than anybody else and the books that I read and the research that I did and mentors advice and all the rest of it. Yeah. Laura, how do you think you really get to know yourself? What, what, what advice would you give to people who are unsure of if they do know themselves or how they get to know themselves and like you've very kindly said you know it is a journey you'll I'm sure admit that you are not fully there yet and that's just the, that's the joy of life to be fair but is there anything practical or even just in your own experience that you can share for others yeah yeah for sure and like you said there is no destination that's the thing it's a massive cliche but it's absolutely true and I think for so long the, you know and for so many for I was feeling and I think for so many people you sort of feel like there's this place that you're going to arrive at when everything's fixed and sorted and you've got it all in check but actually for me it's just this constant you know beautiful balancing act of, of things which you need things which you want and crafting you know crafting a life which you live every day so what what would I recommend I mean I'm a coach so obviously like I'm biased like get yourself a life coach if you can but if you can't then like and I have a coach, all coaches have a coach really normally. But the, the big thing I say is read, like you can read about the topic, like share your authentic experience with other women for a start, like ask them honestly, like cut the crap, like what actually do you enjoy? And you know, what? how much money do you need to earn? How much money do I need to earn to make, to facilitate the lifestyle that you wanna live? Because there are practical considerations, right? And like, if you've got kids or older dependents or anything else, you've got, you've got to factor that in, it's not just, running and skipping off into the hills and living a fantasy life like you know we all have obligations yeah. Yeah. but you can create that so reading has been great for me like I've I've read a lovely book called Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nagoski um and that's worth a google guys like it's the best self-help book I've written for women another another book that um uh, that I've really loved by Glennon Doyle is Untamed like it's a massive multi-million like bestseller and sometimes you just, you know, taking the time out to reflect, meditate if you can, just do the things which you enjoy and, and just, you know, being the driver of your life experience rather than a passenger, if you know what I mean, just going through the motions. So anything you can do to help with that, I think would be great. Yeah, you know, this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this webinar, because I just <laughs> buzz off just you know, like-mindedness, we're, we're clearly all like-minded, okay, and there's going to be loads of people listening to this now, but some stuff will relate and some stuff won't, and that's also cool, because if you always surround yourself with people similar, we all know the effects of an echo chamber, so I think just, just keeping mm. this open mind and doing things that are a little bit out of your comfort zone to mm. see if they, everything's uncomfortable until it's comfortable, everything, yeah. that's its very nature. Yeah. Actually, Tony, on that point, I think that's such a great point you make about talking to different types of people. Like one of the reasons I'm so glad to be here is I get so much out of talking to people who work in different um, spaces and sectors and have different lifestyles because like there's always like just having that external influence and that inspiration, getting out of your echo chain and connecting with different types of people, you'll find so much inspiration from that and so much commonality as well. So, yeah yeah and and I love that many hats comment that you've said I mean I must have a wardrobe of 30,000 philosophical hats <laughs> um Liz me and you have had a chat about this before share a little bit of your many hats uh, journey 
I love the many hats journey. So this expectation that bears down on women that you must be superwoman at all times and excel. I mean, I'm not great at maths. I'm going to do 110% at work, parenting, socializing, having the Instagrammable house. I'm joking because my tree looks Instagrammable. (laughs) It is. It's my one thing of the year um it's having the persona that you have it all together that you are well rested you are you know your fitness is there your diet is on point everything is right and that's almost like the many hats isn't it the expectation that women can multitask there is that saying isn't there that men can't multitask well actually is it can't or won't and I think that's the real difference that we look at here is that you can only wear one hat at a time unless you're maybe a clown or you've got some sort of profession, I don't know, that makes you wear many hats, but you can only wear one at once. And I have this deep-rooted feminism in me that says, as a woman, you can have it all. You can do it all. Mm -hmm. You can be anything you want to be. If you put your mind to it, there are no barriers. You can do it all. But what nobody tells you as you're growing up is that you can do that, but not all at the same time and not all at once. And Mm -hmm. that kind of, it takes for you to work through and burn out Mm. back to Laura's point about reading about burnout and all that that, all that great literature that's out there is that you continue with this expectation and whether the hat's all at once doing it all being everything nothing can stop me think Spice Girls girl power all that good stuff we grew up on but actually you can't do that all at the same time you have to prioritize it's the same as software delivery you have a team they have a capacity that capacity has a limit you Mm. have a limit that athlete that is winning and is a champion probably doesn't have a full-time job and eight kids to look after on an evening that isn't sustainable nor is it possible yet we are brought up we are conditioned we believe that we can do all of this And then you get to mid thirties, you have a breakdown at midnight in your front room. You can't stop crying and you wonder what's going on and you think you're a failure. And that's speaking from experience. I did that. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't pretty, bit of an ugly crier. Um, But then you have to really work out and scale back and you have to prioritize what you do, who you do it for. And you have to put your children above your career. You have to let the gym go and you perhaps have to sit and eat ice cream on an evening because you can't be bothered cooking. (laughs) <laughs> and that's your life and you're not a failure you are yeah. normal you are normal do you know what Liz that is just more Liz. Me. so I've um so I, I'm I'm one of those people I am I love goal setting I, I love chatting with friends around things that yeah. make me happy and I love finding out about myself and, mm-hmm. and and I do try and do all the things you've done I, I try and be the best mum I can I try and be great at work try and be a great wife and friend and all of those things and I've got like this thing in my head. So I, I know what I love. And they are um, mountain walks, log fires, candles, and the beach, right? Those four things. Now, they're not all going to be in one place at any one time. <laughs> so I recognize, I, I, I'm one of those people, coming towards the end of a year, I'm one of those people that I have to sit somewhere on New Year's Day with a notebook and pen. And I have to just have a bit of reflection time. It's just me. And it helps if I'm in one of those four places. Yeah. Um, Luckily, I've got it again this year. And on this same book that I have, I have this like list of all the things that I want in my life. So the things that make me happy. And I have like this score system and I score where I feel I am against them. And then I just cross-reference it. Only when I open the book, I don't do it very regimented. And what's really interesting, actually, sometimes I've been quite hard on myself why they're never all eights, nines and tens. But actually, over time, I'm okay with like, that one's a one and a two. Am I okay with that being a one and a two right now? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And it oddly, it does refocus where I need to put a little bit of my own thinking time, a little bit of my you know focus of efforts. So I, I find that really interesting. It, it's simply what you just said but with my own geeky little way of doing it I like your geeky way of doing it because that holds you accountable to not lose who you are and I think a lot of us do end up putting other people's needs before our own we'll put work we'll put children we'll put the house we'll put housework we'll put other things other people's needs and then you realize you've not been doing anything that's good for your soul and you wonder why you're ratty you wonder why you're snapping naturally you're not performing quite well on any of the things that you think you've put as a priority and you have to bake into your life things that feed your soul so as Laura was mentioning all you know the kind of reading the literature and and all that kind of good stuff things like Tony going for a walk 
mean, you wouldn't hike up a mountain on a beach, but I get where you're going, you're coming from. Buying mm-hmm. that candle, buy that candle. If it makes you feel good, buy that candle. Go for that walk alone. Take yourself for a spa break for the weekend on your own. If that's what's good for your soul, do it. Mm-hmm. And I think we just, we are the first people and we are women that do that, that just go, put my needs aside, other people need me and wonder why we feel so sad and deflated at times. I am um, I recently actually did a little bit of work around this type of thing um and unfortunately it does tend to be a trait that women have a bit more than men that we are pleasers um which at first I was like but that's a good thing like I want people around me to be happy and that's a lovely thing but then I realized that actually becomes a saboteur at some point because it flips too much the other way and you're constantly pleasing and not doing anything for yourself um but one of the things I'd say around obviously Liz and Tony you've said about those things that you want to prioritize something that's helped me in the workplace in particular is being really open with my team about that that actually there are some non-negotiables and for me to be brilliant at my job I have to have these non-negotiables one of those for me is that if I'm in the office 12 till 12.45 is my time to go to the gym. Very lucky that we have a um, gym in our office. But that just irrelevant of what's happened at home, whether I've had a completely sleepless night, um, you know, because of my kids, that is my recharge. Um, Someone uh, else, it was our CHRO, and she was talking about how um, we... My company is a very extroverted company, but she is an introvert. And she got to a point where she would go home and lock herself in the bathroom because it was just all too much. And she couldn't even talk to her kids, you know, for the first 10 minutes when she got home. She's like, I need to change something. And her non-negotiable was my lunchtime is the one time that I close my office door and I turn my back and I read my book and I have my lunch completely on my own. And that half an hour, I don't get you know don't get anyone come to my door and that was her non-negotiable I think it takes time to get there and you know time to get the confidence to be open about it but once you share those things then it also again sets a really good um precedent for what is allowed amongst the rest of your team of like this is okay that you have your non-negotiables and these will recharge you and you'll be you know ready to go if you do these things yeah can I pick up on that one actually because I think this theme like what you're describing for me is like it's about boundaries mm. and every like so many people I coach or I talk to actually a lot of their problems stem from boundaries one not knowing what they really want and two not setting boundaries to protect those things and I feel that that's a you know re- that is a bit of a, a women's trait in particular we do tend to be more people pleasers um in general and I think it's really, really important. And I think sometimes we, we do that when we sort of lack confidence or there's a bit of an insecurity and we sort of think, oh, well, I'll make them happy and then that will, they'll give me the affirmation I need to feel better about myself. And actually there's, there's a power in, let's like say, drawing boundaries and saying, no, I know myself well enough that I work best when I go for lunch break or I have a break at the end of work or I limit the number of calls that I'm on and prioritise, you know, quite focus time or whatever it might be mm. and knowing when you've, you've you've had enough and that you're going to stop and that these pressures which other people will endlessly put upon you need to be pushed back upon and holding your ground but it takes like a quiet confidence to be able to do that and I think a lot of the time I see women allowing their boundaries to be treaded on by other people and when you scratch the surface it's because people don't necessarily feel confident in their own approach, their own style, their own deliverables or whatever. And you've got to ask yourself, when are you enough? Like, when is what you're doing good enough that you can then say, yeah, no, I, I did that task and I am, and I did these other things and I prioritise well and it's six o'clock and I'm going home. And, you know, I may or may not have kids, that's irrelevant, but no, well, you're not going to lean upon me to like do this stuff. And I think you know, in a way, we, you know, we've got some, well, we've all got children. And so we've talked a bit about the pressures of other people. In a way, if you're somebody who's choosing or can't, or for whatever reason, you know, isn't bound by other dependents like kids or elders or whatever, you still absolutely 110% deserve to draw those boundaries for yourself. And I think sometimes there's this sort of feeling of like, oh, I haven't got an excuse. or And, and, and in a way, as a parent, you can lean upon that excuse. Or I've got to go. 
but actually that that makes it easier in some ways to say no to people if you haven't got that mm -hmm. you you still need to be able to do exactly the same thing which is assert yourself and say actually i work at my best when these conditions are in place and this is what i want and actually also I don't necessarily want to give this job my whole life, right? You know, a, a job is a job. Your life is bigger than that. And work won't love you back. So we need to be able to all, you know, like you were saying earlier, Liz, like you always wanted to be the dependable one there first thing in the morning, there last thing at night, always on it, the one that gets called. That's great. But also you, you know, you need to be able to call it for yourself and say, I have this much energy to give. And if I give more than that, I'm going to start getting tired. I'm going to start underperforming and I'm going to be resentful. And guess what? I'm going to burn out and I'm going to leave or move on to something else. So I think it's really important for us to just to define what you're willing to give, what great looks like. And when you're ready to stop and move away from something, not leave the company, but leave that task, leave that day. Or I guess eventually one day leave whatever your situation and move on to the next thing. No, I, I, what are you, sorry, um, um, you saying about energy, I think is a really good point. Um, and someone once told me manage your energy, not your time. And yeah. I think it's a great way to think about, you know, what gives me energy. So actually, in Liz's, um, you know, situation, there might be times that being the last person there for your team actually does give you energy. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So it's taking up your time, but it's mm -hmm. not draining your energy. But actually, if it becomes something that drains your energy that's when it becomes a problem and you need to set a boundary I think I just wanted to pick up on a piece around boundaries it's taken me a long time to know my worth my mm. worth is not a time frame it's not the amount of work that I churn through it is the quality that you get from me and that has taken 30 something years to realize mm. in the working world that I am not defined by burnout I'm not defined by exhaustion I'm not defined by being the last one in the building at midnight I'm defined by what I bring to the table which again has taken quite some thinking in terms of what that means and that does mean setting my boundaries early on it means knowing that and I've had to do a lot of soul searching and if anybody on the call here is thinking well how do I get to that it's not just a, I'm going to sit down for 10 minutes with a notepad and work out what my worth is it does take a bit of time and confidence to do that and as somebody that has you know crippling imposter syndrome and a level of anxiety and all that kind of good stuff that goes with you know being a, a successful woman it's not easy but once you do those boundaries fall into place a bit easier the ability to say no becomes easier because you know and you are secure in what you bring to the table and it's unique to you but that's what makes Definitely. you special. something really interesting happened to me recently and it follows on from what we've just been saying so I feel really valued in my job I have very easy to talk to bosses I have a fabulous HR director honestly like it, it genuinely couldn't be much better yeah. And a situation happened where I was on holiday and I received an email about this away day that I knew we were going on. And in my head, my early expectation was an away day, single, one day. And I got the invite and it said nine till five, Thursday and Friday, location, Cotswolds, about a four and a half hour drive from my house. And for the first time in a long time, everything changed in my headspace I don't know if it's because I was on holiday with my kids mm. but all of a sudden I had this I mean I don't, I don't get anxious I, I, I don't get nervous I don't lose confidence in saying how I feel and for some reason I just felt I could not say to the person who is fabulous and considerate and lovely that's too much that, that's too big and I there was a real mismatch of the expectation versus what I thought was happening simply just because of I mean the way that I view things is if I'm not here when my kids get up that's like one chunk of time they miss so it doesn't matter if I'm back at 10 a.m in the morning they don't see me until six so that that one hour window is really important and the same at night so this one was taking away five windows five opportune moments and for, I just I, I wrote the same email about three times. No word of a lie. Just I don't know how to communicate it. And this none of this is typical of my personality mm. style of my role. 
something happened again, very similar situation uh, only recently, which was, a, I think it was just a nine o'clock meet, but in London, and it just meant I couldn't get a train early enough. And again, I really struggled with the cons, even though these people are the easiest people to talk to. Now, when I actually did say how I was feeling, no problem, family comes first. There, there was literally no concern. But what was so interesting is why was I thinking all of that when this is not, I, I don't think this normally, and I, and I still don't really know the answer. I haven't explored it much, but it, it felt very pertinent to mention that now based on what we've just discussed. But you are human, Tony. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say that. And actually, I think that's such a powerful share um, because... I think so often we put ourselves in little boxes with labels slapped on our foreheads, like I'm bold, I'm not anxious, I'm strong, I'm capable, I can deal with anything, like I'm low maintenance or I'm, you know, I'm a high achiever or I am nervous or I'm a crap speaker or I'm disorganized or whatever. And actually we can all be brave, we can all be vulnerable, we can all be anxious, we can all feel insecure. Um, and we can also all be brilliant and confident and absolutely smash it. Like it just depends on the day and the circumstances. And I think that's really powerful because a lot of the time, I think us as women, we compare our insides to other people's outsides. And you don't get to see what's going on inside somebody else. You get to see often the Instagrammable vision of stuff. But everybody's got their things, however brilliant and successful and confident. We all have our little moments. Um, I think there's something else I wanted to mention actually it was just going back to a point Liz made which I thought was really great about um, and I was thinking about you were talking about strengths and getting to know yourself and the value added that you bring and I think that's so powerful this idea that you know it's not about how much I do it's not about am I there for everything am I you know it's what is the value that I bring like what what is it why am I here? Like, what are the best bits about me? And, and quite often I talk to people who, who are like, oh, I'm not good enough at this. I need to build my strengths. I need to gain experience or I should get a qualification. And if I only did this and if I never, if I was, if, if, if I could be better. And actually there's something to be said for improving yourself. Like I'm obviously all up for learning. I absolutely love it. It's why I flip around in my career and do different things because I just love learning. But there's also something to be said of like, we, we tend, as humans, I think we tend to focus on our weaknesses and our bits where we want to change and improve, but actually there's real power in leveraging your strengths. And I think as women, we could much more get to know ourselves and use objective evidence from other people and the lovely feedback and really listen to the feedback that we get when it's good. What is it about you that is brilliant? What is it about you that you know you're on solid ground with and use that more, like use your strengths. That's your US. None of us are the full pack package. None of us are perfect. We all have areas we want to develop, but rather than putting all our energies into dragging yourself up, like if you're like, I'm crap with numbers, you know what? You could probably put in a load of effort and be a bit better with numbers. But ultimately, if you are incredible on people and stakeholder management and you're charismatic and you can pitch, do that. Like do, do that, do more of that and leverage your resources and other people around you to support your, your weaker areas, but really go big on what makes you special. It's much more energy giving and affirming and you'll, you'll definitely add more value to your company and, and in your career um, rather than beating yourself up about other details which you wish were different. Actually, something yeah. that um, we've used as a team recently is the Superpowers app. Um, super cheap um, just get it on the app store um, and it's you know it's not to do with how many times I've smashed my number or how many sales I've made or how many clients I have or anything like that it literally is like what is an inherent superpower um, and I think in terms of self-reflection it's a really good one it's just a load of questions really quick few minutes um, so anyone on the call today if they wanted to um, I'd say download the superpowers app and have a little look like for me it rang really true my um, worth that I bring is basically positive yeah. energy so that's my thing <laughs> relevant of like what code I could write or you know what I can do technically positive energy is my personal brand and that came out in the superpower app um so it was very true for me so something that may be worth having a look at I think that's brilliant and to, back to Laura's point earlier around get yourself a life coach I 
invested in a wonderful strength um, coach very recently. In fact, during the pandemic, I was thrown into a consultancy role that I didn't think I was capable of. Um, I, I didn't have that confidence. I kept thinking I couldn't do the detail. I wouldn't understand the systems and I wouldn't understand the people in the sector. And I went down this spiral of I can't, I can't, I can't. And I'm hoping she's on the call today, actually, Debbie Palmer. But she sat me down and focused me in on my strengths. And I realised, actually, what I can do is I can communicate. I can work with stakeholders. I am motivating, a bit like you, Sevda, which is brilliant to hear that positive leadership quality that I think you need in a lot of situations, especially in consultancy. And I started to realise that actually the qualities that I had matched perfectly to the role. I just couldn't <laughs> see it. I needed somebody to bridge that gap. Oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. I'm going in as an agile delivery manager, but I can't do the detailed uh, project plans. But actually what I can do is all of those qualities that can get me there and give me a little bit of time to settle in and work out where my strengths are and talk to people and be with people and fit in and integrate the role just clicked but I'd spent so long thinking about the areas that I couldn't do that I couldn't see what I could do and I think it's a real as especially as women in business and when wanting to either climb the career ladder or wanting to go off and learn something new and, and focus in your role or even if you just want to do it for you day to day you might be part of the PTA you might run a, a dance company on a weekend you might be a football coach whatever that is knowing what your strengths are then makes the whole experience enjoyable mm -hmm. I can't describe it it's really weird mm -hmm. but it just yeah it's great it's really interesting Liz because um all the research shows that men will apply for a job if they have 60% of the qualifications, whereas yeah. women will only apply if they have 100% of the qualifications. Mm -hmm. That's yep. the perfect example. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, that plays yeah, out. I was, I was thinking that, Sevda, when you said it. Out of curiosity, because I think there's been quite a lot around knowing your strengths, so it'd be great to get some takeaways from that. What, what do we think in terms of where that responsibility lies between your employer and yourself and kind of the split accountability? Good question. Yeah, good question. I, um, I think a lot of it lies with you, but you need mm -hmm. a safe environment to be able to grow. And there's that old, there's that motto that goes around, around the flower and fixing, you don't fix the flower, you fix the environment. And you find yourself in an organisation that allows you that freedom to speak, that freedom to be, be that person, that supportive line manager that pushes you just enough out of your comfort zone but doesn't watch you fall over and fail they're there to kind of catch you you are empowered and you have the autonomy to make your way and then I think it's up to you then to grab those opportunities and run with them and I don't think it's anybody else's responsibility to make sure you do that if you give you the yeah. give you the right environment off you go and I don't know if Sevda Laura you've got any thoughts on that but that's how I feel it should be mm -hmm. and it is yeah. yeah go ahead Laura I was, I was going to say that I, I agree I think quite, quite often we use the analogy sort of like driving a car earlier right of that who's who's in the driving seat and I think sometimes women in particular uh, I, it may also be the case for some men well it definitely is the case for some men but particularly with women I sort of see them sometimes feeling a bit done to like as in oh I've been given this project it's not really going to further my ambitions it's not really what I'm interested in so I'm just going to have to get on with it um or I'm really overworked and stretched it's kind of coming from a scarcity mindset yeah. um this idea that I'm being done to and that other people have control and power over my career and actually I would challenge the women on this call to think about an abundance mindset like proactively seek out opportunities proactively seek out connections make things happen by asking and it's amazing like if you know what you want and you ask for it you can manifest quite a lot and I think that the annual appraisal cycle again often people tend to sort of take a bit of a back seat and they're sort of like oh what's my feedback going to be but equally it's a it's, it's a 50 50 it's like an opportunity for you to go out and get like in three years from now what do you want to achieve what stepping stones can you take to move you closer to your end game um over the next year like what if you lay that down in front of your line manager and say right these are the areas i want to develop these are opportunities i want to have these are experiences this is what i'm gunning for like here are the ideas i've got around it but what ideas do you have like, are there things that i could get involved with i equally there might be things where you say i don't i don't want to be doing as much as i'm doing i need to pull back and actually my end game is more around well-being and balance and that's okay too 
And in that case, like what are the things which you would actually most like to drop or to change? And so I, I would encourage people to be really proactive about it, even to the extent of like crafting your own, people might have heard of the personal boardroom activity, like this idea of like proactively seeking champions and mentors and cheerleaders and empaths, just a team of people. And if anyone wants to just Google personal boardroom, there's like a million different versions of this out there, just go and have a look. But the principle is that you're taking command of your network and you're saying, you know, I am going to actively invite in. You don't, you don't have to say to people like, will you be on my personal board? <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to acknowledge that to anyone. But in your head, you're like, you, you probably need one person who, you know, like Liz described her family situation earlier. Like you just probably want another mum that you can chat with and just be like, man, it's so hard. You know, there's like probably like, you know, for the emotional support. And then there'll be somebody who's maybe like a cheerleader figure who just, they believe in you, they've got your back. They're just telling you, you can do this. And there might be other people with technical skills that you want to acquire, that you want to spend more time with, or people with like leadership quality, which you just aspire to be. Name these people, go out, find them, ask them for a you know, a coffee, do it again and again, get closer to them and, and, and proactively glean from them the things which you desire, if that makes sense. And, and that's a two way process, right? You help them. And the best way to, if you don't know how to approach those people, is to offer them help, first of all, right? It's a two way street. So you don't just go in with the big asks that so you go in with, I'd love to you know, connect with you. Can I help you with anything right now, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, I mean, there is a responsibility there for the employer, like you said, to facilitate these opportunities, to support, to, to see the whole person, not just to see the job as a function which needs to be carried out. But then I also think there's a lot that we can do ourselves to, you know, create the environment and the circumstances we want. Yeah, definitely. And Seven, there's there's five on that. Um, definitely I think we take the uh, driving seat um, one of the things I guess I would say um, for those that are in the employer seat of how you can help people take that driving seat is understanding what their purpose is within their role so I think that's mm -hmm. the sweet spot isn't it when you find like what they're good at what the company objectives are and their purpose, that middle section is where you have a sweet spot. And as the employer, if you can help bring out that purpose within what they're doing, um, then I think people feel a lot more confident um, to then be in that driving seat. Absolutely. There's a really interesting model, uh, ABC, around when people are truly fulfilled within a workplace environment. And that is when they feel they are working autonomously, when they belong and when they have the capability or the competency to actually complete the job. And I think there's a real opportunity just to check in with yourself there around. Are those things occurring for me right now? Does the organisation I work for enable them? Maybe I'm not fully there, but, you know, are there gaps that I can maybe help to bridge those gaps? Mm, yeah. I think that's really helpful actually, Tony, and it, it, it sparks a thought in me, which is about resilience. And I think for anyone listening that's having a hard time at work at the moment um, and feels that they ought to be more resilient, all the research about resilience says that most of us get it wrong, like what we think about it. And most of us think that resilience is about like, you know, digging in, making the best of it, you know, that go-getter kind of mentality. And I, I don't want anyone to confuse that with what we were saying about being proactive about creating the life and career that you want. Because actually the, what the research says about resilience is that resilience exists within a social structure, within a network. So you can't be, you can't take care of yourself. You can't make the best of opportunities. If you're not like Liz said, in an environment like the flower in the ground where you can't thrive, so, for example, you might have initiatives at work which sort of say, like, take an hour, you know, you've got an extra hour slot, go do yoga, go do the gym. But if at the same time all the people around you are booking meeting slots over that time period or nobody is modelling that for you and actually there's a bit of, like, snidey remarks but when people do leave time, leave on time or take up those things or just generally there's no exposure, you know, support for that, you're not going to be able to maximize so we think as an if, if there's any employers that are like listening in I think there is something really really important about are you 
Are you creating a resilient culture? Are you facilitating the best thinking? Are you creating an environment of psychological safety, which is evidence confirms like the number one factor in high performing teams. And what we mean by that is the ability to speak your truth without fear of reprisal or negative impact. And if, if you are creating that environment, then you, you know and you can trust that what people will be sharing with you will be helpful and constructive and helping you forwards. But if you're creating an environment of fear or judgment, then really as an individual, there's very little you can do against the power of culture. You know, you, you, can, you can create and influence the space around you, but you need everybody else to also do their bit to create that culture that you want to, to remain in. I think there's an element of respect that comes around that as well. So if you've got people that are working either for you, if you're in a leadership position, or if you've got people working around you and they have their clear boundaries set out and it's taken them a while to get there, this may have taken them a number of years. They may still be fearful. They may just be trying it. So people may walk away from this session and say, do you know what? As of next week, I'm going to block out that 45 minutes and go for a walk. And it's going to take a lot of courage to do so. And you're their line manager and you look and say, this important deadline's coming. I really need that 45 minutes. I'm just going to slam that meeting over the top of it. You are not respecting your people. You're not respecting them as human beings. You're not respecting their feelings. You are treating them as resource. And that's where that word comes in that we look at everybody and goes, where's my resource? Where are they? I need this. I need that. They're not resource. They're people. They have boundaries. They have feelings, they have emotions, a bit like you, Tony, when you received that and you didn't know how to react is because you're human. You have emotions. We're not robots, even though we think we're programmed to. And we need to respect each other. You know, vulnerability is not a sign of weakness. Feelings and emotion in a workplace is not a sign of weakness. And we need to make sure that we are respecting people's journeys, that they may be on a few years behind us. They may be playing catch up. They may be new to this, is that. What is our impact of not respecting that boundary? And it could be quite severe. It could be minimal, but that's not your call to make. That's up to that individual. Yeah, you've just got me thinking, actually. So I, I do manage quite a large team. And I've heard this debate. Let, let's just use the lunchtime one as an example, because I think we got some feedback from our consultants that asked our training provider not to book in any training sessions over lunchtime to respect that time. And I'm sat there thinking, yeah, you know, great feedback, good, I agree with all that. And I'm just listening to everyone thinking, I definitely book meetings in people's diaries at either 12 or 1. Now, I do that on the assumption that they're still going to take their lunchtime or that they're going to reject my meeting because we don't, we don't have a set lunchtime. We have complete flexi hours. And I am just questioning myself a little bit around should I create a window that I don't ask for any meetings? Should because I've, I've got a big team, it's 70 people. So do, do I go and have 70 conversations to say, where's your lunchtime? Where's that boundary? I'm quite curious what everyone thinks. I think that's where the psychological safety comes in. Like knowing you, Tony, I'm pretty sure that you've you've you will have created that that culture where people feel able to speak their truth to you and say, that's and that right. that's what I'm talking about, where people can sort of say, like, you know, actually, I'd rather we didn't do meetings or they would take it upon themselves to block that time in the diary so that you can see that that's blocked and therefore you can't look over it or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think I think that's where that that's where it's about culture and it's there's different yeah. practical approaches you could take. But do you feel that the relationships are in place where people can say how they feel and what they want and be proactive? Because if not, then, yeah, maybe like having hard and fast rule will work. But you might you might might not need one you know I think it's just about that that honesty that exists between people and that sense of trust and respect they know that they won't be judged if they push back yeah and I would like to hope so but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna assume I'm just gonna go and have a few conversations I think post this session just to as a check-in point you know that's not a bad thing on the flip side of putting the onus on the individual our vice president or our head of has put a blanket 12 to 1 take a break in it's in everybody's mm -hmm. diary, just sent out to everybody, whether that individual mm -hmm. takes that up or not, or whether they deem to move that, that's their choice. But it's almost mandated to have that break in the day that's kind of a spillover from uh, lockdown and that exhaustion and that Teams mm -hmm. and Zoom fatigue that we all had. So there's kind of a variety of ways, but you know your people, you know what works for them. And mm -hmm. once you've done that, you can you know, do the process that works best for them. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Okay. We're sort of coming towards the end of the webinar. And I just want to say like an enormous thanks. There's been some really thought-provoking content there and some great takeaways. Um, I've seen lots of individuals within the chat asking for the transcript. So just for anybody that has asked for that, we have a fabulous marketing team who are dialed into this, um, <laughs> taking notes, taking all the key takeaways. And of course, that will be available for anybody that wants that. And I've got the list. If, you, if you've signed up, which you obviously have, we have your email address. So we can certainly send out. Um, I won't just send you the transcript. Like We've got an opportunity to clean that up and make it really, hopefully, um, really useful and helpful for you. So, um, yeah, look forward to that in the coming time. But I do just want to say a big thank you. Um, as a bit of a roundup, just to each of, of the three of you, have you got any key lessons learned? I mean, we've had so many takeaways. that I, I am literally feeling quite high on energy here, which is great. But let's just see if there's anything we think we've missed or that we just really want to try and hammer home. Um, big one for me, this is a key takeaway, is don't view other women as competition. They are your allies. Do not spend your life as a lone wolf thinking you are in competition with everyone. They are super important to your career, your mental well-being and your village. And find yourself a mentor that supports that, someone you can turn to and helps you grow that village but do not see each other as competition. We're in it together. Yeah. I think maybe one that I'll take out um, as a bit of a summary of something that's come up quite a lot is you can do anything, but you can't do everything. That's brilliant. I love both of those so much. Um, for me, um, it's probably a combination of just get to know yourself like and what you want and stop with the comparisons um and forget what uh forget what you're supposed to do and just come up with what it is that brings you happiness and fulfillment and, and pursue that to the exclusion of everybody else <laughs> and my one that i've learned from this is manage your energy not your time i am stealing that one and using it daily so thank you Sevda. Um, thank you all once again. Um, do you know what? That was, I know that, that was just so much fun. I will want to do another one in the new year. So if there is enough, um, yeah, enough interest from everybody, then drop me a note. I, we love feedback. So um, please do continue to send some of that on. But thank you all for your time. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. Thanks again. and see you soon. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.